Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, master class. Uh, thank you for uh, joining in uh, the morning United States time, afternoon in, in Europe, and, and uh, uh, evening and late night uh, out east of that. Um, it is uh, our, our pleasure to be doing this master class today. Uh, and uh, I will start by uh, doing some introductions, and then we will launch into our presentation. Uh, we will have uh, Q&A, so by all means, as you get questions, don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A, and we will reserve time at the end of this master class to cover any and all of your questions that we can get to. Um, my name is Usama Fayyad. I'm chairman at Open Insights and the executive director of the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University. Um, I've spent uh, most of my professional life trying to make AI and machine learning solutions work in practice in different places, including uh, NASA, Microsoft, several startups, uh, Yahoo, when they acquired my second startup, um, startups after that, uh, at Open Insights, which I started after leaving Yahoo in 2008, and gave me the opportunity to work with, uh, you know, Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 companies around the world on exactly problems like this of making AI work. And we'll be sharing with you uh, a lot of these uh, lessons, hopefully. Uh, and of course, always happy to discuss more of them. I have a very special uh, co-speaker in this masterclass, uh, a longtime friend, and definitely one of the big experts in the area of uh, data science, machine learning, and AI, uh, Ashok Srivastava, who uh, today is a senior vice president and the chief data officer at uh, Intuit. Uh, Ashok, you want to introduce yourself for a few minutes? Osama, it's so great to be here. I'm so excited to be able to spend a bit of time with, with you and uh, work on this masterclass with you. Uh, my name is Ashok Srivastava. I've, as you said, I'm at Intuit. I've been here for about four and a half years and have been working to build a team that does AI data and analytics. And so uh, we're on an amazing journey and it's very exciting to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, thanks Ashok. And Ashok and I go back to the days when he was at NASA actually. So uh, let me uh, share a presentation with you here. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about the pragmatic uh, problem of making uh, AI solutions work in business. Uh, and we'll talk about that strong connection between AI and data, which is often uh, overlooked. Um, and we'll have a focus on, on financial services, uh, given kind of our backgrounds as well. Uh, so AI and, and data science, making AI work correctly is one of the grand challenges facing us today. A lot of the advanced computation, next generation computation, if you will, is being labeled AI. Uh, you'll see articles uh, uh, prompting this all over the place. Um, but the thing to remember is that uh, many things have been happening in parallel. Uh, digitization has taken hold and has been greatly accelerated with COVID-19. We'll talk some about that and its impact. Uh, AI has proven to be very difficult for a lot of companies to get working. Uh, and it's, it became an area of mystery. Uh, although in, in the places where it worked, it has undoubtedly uh, deliver, delivered many uh, uh, applications of value. Machine learning and data science represent the dominant part of any working AI today. And we'll talk about why is that. And something that seems very, very obvious is that machine learning has a huge, and data science have a huge dependence on data. Uh, seems like an obvious statement, but in practice, uh, it, it's not so obvious. So uh, we all went through uh, the hard times of the pandemic, everything closed, which drove everybody to go online. And it was a question of, uh, do you go online uh, or do you die as a business? Uh, there was no other option, which helped overcome many of the hesitation uh, many of the folks who kind of were saying, well, let's wait and see when well, they no longer had the option to wait and see. Uh, they were forced to go digital. Uh, suddenly they realized, hey, this stuff works actually. And sometimes 
customers like it uh, even better. Uh, and hey, it allows us to do business more efficiently. So a phenomenon happened where those who embraced digital in a serious way actually got a boost out of the very unfortunate circumstances we were, we were in. And there was a wide acceptance of uh, uh, that, that digital channel that we are all so familiar with right now and we're trying to even compensate for over familiarity with it. Um, financial services, let's talk about digital transformation. By the way, it's not new. It's been going on for over seven decades in financial services. My favorite example is, is accounting. If you look at you know, 60, 70 years ago, uh, accounting was a very different thing, right? Uh, to be an accountant, you had to know how to deal with you know, these big ledgers. You had to have a good handwriting. You have to do good addition in your head. Uh, a lot of those skills are kind of irrelevant uh, today. Accounting is something completely different, whether you're using QuickBooks or any of the uh, solutions out there for, for ledgers. Um, and, and Excel sort of completely uh, changed how we deal with this. But what is interesting is the role of the accountant evolved from kind of what I would consider a, a, a primarily a cost to a much higher value role doing analysis and understanding data. And what's interesting uh, and, and understanding what the numbers are saying, what is really interesting here is that this digitization did not replace jobs. In fact, we have more accountants today than we have in the entire history of humanity. So this is about elevating the role and kind of enabling uh, better uses of human capabilities, which are uniquely human versus machine capabilities, which machines are often better uh, in at addition and things like that than humans. Now, history gives us many examples of what happens when you fail to kind of uh, uh, adopt digital. Uh, the famous example or infamous one is Kodak, used to be a household name. Uh, and, and, and you know everybody knew what the Kodak moment was. Uh, well, Kodak actually invented the digital camera. Uh, they just didn't figure out how to leverage it for their own business and let others leverage it. And suddenly that new business of digital photography effectively eliminated the entire business of Kodak and they had to of films and printing, uh, et cetera, and essentially ended up going bankrupt at 124 years old. Now, I wanna emphasize this, 124 years old, right? These, these guys survived the Spanish flu pandemic. They survived world wars. They survived uh, so many changes, the whole tech and industrial, good parts of the industrial revolution, yet they couldn't survive kind of this digital transformation because they didn't adopt the digital. Uh, an example from the retail industry, J.C. Penney, again uh, went back. You know, un unlike its competitors, they actually were very hesitant to embrace uh, digital channel. And essentially, after uh, 118 years old, again had to declare bankruptcy and go out of business. Now. The you can achieve amazing things. Uh, I like the example in insurance, the Vitality program. You know, eating healthy and going to the gym and things like that. Uh, Capital One is a famous example in the US where they embrace digital and they talk publicly. Their CEOs basically says, uh, you know, digital is, is not even about cost reduction for us. It's about a complete transformation to use uh, their, their CEO's world uh, words. Uh, and finally, I like the example of DBS. Probably many of you who are not in Singapore never heard of it, but in, in 2012, DBS was a bank effectively on its way to go out of business. They were in trouble. They needed serious transformation. They embraced digital, they embraced analytics. And in fact, within a few years, five years, they basically became the number one bank uh, in that market in Singapore and, and still growing. So it does make a huge difference to do what's right, but it, sometimes there are unintended, unintended consequences, right? Many of the digital transformations focus on digitizing workflow uh, so that means they can no longer know, you know, despite the fact that the digital workflow is more efficient, more consistent, 
more repeatable, uh, you lose that human touch. You lose the ability of a customer rep to understand, hey, our customer's happy, our service is being delivered. Why are customers leave, leaving us? Where are they going? What is making them unhappy? And what is delighting them? Uh, so the question now becomes is how do you restore that intimacy uh, uh, through data, right? And the same has happened in banks. Banks used to be uh, very uh, branch oriented, very local, very intimate. You know, the branch manager and, and uh, uh, officers knew the customers. They knew who wanted to buy a horse and who was growing the farm and who wanted to send the kid to college and who was getting married, who was getting divorced, who was in trouble credit wise. So a lot of these things were simple. Uh, that today, when they scaled and they went to uh, uh, large operations without this focus on, on knowing the customer intimately, uh, the things like the front office became much more expensive, data silos showed up everywhere, uh, tracking and understanding who each customer is became a real challenge, the back office became extremely expensive, so things like assessing risk. Uh, at a bank like Barclays, where I worked for three years as their global chief data officer, it was uh, 300 million pounds a year spent on kind of risk. And uh, there was uh, 200 plus million a year on KYC, just know your customer programs. Um, so uh, as we move uh, from, from this transactional view on the world to understanding intent, uh, you know, there are many opportunities here and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here with a short story. Uh, you know, let's say Kelly makes a deposit in her account at a bank and Kelly is in good standing. Usually that's the end of the story. However, believe it or not, that bank actually has access to a lot more information about Kelly. They just don't know how to leverage it. And we'll talk about how to change that in this uh, uh, masterclass. They could easily have inferred Kelly has student debt. Kelly just got married. Uh, Kelly is probably saving to buy a house. Uh, well, what they could have done, for example, is make offers that are very relevant. They don't feel like ads, they, they feel like helping. Uh, so the bank could offer Kelly refinancing for a student loan or uh, 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 a loan to, to buy a house at the appropriate time, helping her build towards the right mortgage. Uh, the other thing that happens uh, with digitization is you get a lot more data. And a lot more data is good news for algorithms, typically bad news for, for humans. So the data algorithms need uh, are in a different format. It needs to be much more granular, much more detailed. Uh, humans usually like summaries and you know, high level views and aggregations. Uh, and the other dimension of this is 90% of that data you know, being uh, generated at most companies today is unstructured and most organizations speak of structured data only. So that's another challenge they all face because they haven't figured out how to embrace uh, big data properly. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Ashok to, to talk to us about kind of small businesses uh, into it and, and kind of how they uh, assess the impact of uh, COVID-19. Ashok? Sama, you know, I loved the, um the pitch that you just made about how important it is that we actually have a good understanding of the data and how that data can actually be used to transform a business because that's the stage that a lot of companies are at big or small because of the changes that have happened in covid that have been accelerated due to covid people are trying to figure out how to monetize how to create new businesses online and in in other areas and data plays a critical role in that. I mean, you know, you're the world's first chief data officer. And I know that the world uh, view that you have and, and many of us have is that data can actually produce a lot of value for people and improve personalization and also help build good recommendations and other types of systems. You know, today what I wanted to talk about um, is how COVID actually impacted small businesses. And it's an interesting story. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we were approached by some people who wanted to see if we could use our own data that we have on small businesses in order to understand the impact of COVID. And just to frame this for, um, for the audience, Intuit is a company that uh, has um, multiple uh, major product lines. One of them is called QuickBooks. QuickBooks is essentially a, a software that is available online that allows people to manage and run their business. And some of the statistics 
about QuickBooks are extraordinary. I'm just going to give you a couple of them. Um, we have about 9.3 million customers uh, for QuickBooks, and it's increasing at about 16% year over year. And um, we have about $350 billion that are moved across uh, the QuickBooks platform in a given year. Um, some of the other statistics, we put out loans, and the loans are um, in uh, large volume to, uh, to small businesses, about a billion dollars in loans to small businesses uh, since 2017. We also have other uh, major product lines. So Mint, a lot of people use Mint. This is a consumer finance application, and it essentially allows people to manage their books, their personal books, their personal finances through, um, through Mint. Credit Karma is an important member of our uh, uh, product line, essentially allows people to understand their uh, finances, their credit, make some uh, assessments about how they can improve credit and so forth. And then obviously TurboTax, probably the best known product line, it uh, essentially allows people to do taxes by themselves or through assisted help uh, online. All of these systems, all of these uh, uh, product lines give us an insight into how data is being used and how that data can be uh, assessed for uh, small businesses. So what I'd like to do is kind of take you through some of these, um, the, the, the way we think about understanding small businesses and how they're being impacted. So at a high level, the architecture that we have is essentially to take data that uh, comes from uh, the uh, QuickBooks ecosystem and to start analyzing it based on things like zip code, the state, the DMA, the counties that we have, and then start uh, processing that data, put it through uh, data checks and rules for uh, essentially looking at um, data quality issues, do some appending of that data, and then start calculating metrics. And those metrics are what reveal to us what's happening with the small businesses. So remember, we're doing this across millions of businesses. All of it is aggregate, all of it is anonymous data. But on the next slide, what you'll see are some key trends that we're looking at. Now, this, uh, these trends are actually taken, as you said, over uh, a long period of time. So since January 2020 until April of 2022, so just a few months ago. If you look at the trends here and you start to take um, make an assessment about what payroll looks like for these companies. So remember, small businesses have payroll. They pay out uh, to, their, uh, to their employees. They have a uh, number of employees. We have that kind of information, as well as the total amount of hours worked. So as you go through this uh, period, you can see that there's an ebb and flow. And frankly, in 2020, you see a decline in, in all three of these metrics. So on uh, payroll customers, you can see a decline uh, happening. And then it starts to build back up around mid-2020. And we can all remember back in March of 2020, the great impact that occurred due to COVID. And then we start to see that rise and it uh, peaks in 2021, and then it starts to uh, decline again. And so some of the uh, major patterns that we're seeing here are uh, very easily seen in this graph. You can see that um, in January 2022, there was a high infection rate, and that caused some labor shortages. And then in April 2022, inflation logistics starting to, to make some impact. So, this is the type of analysis that can be done at an aggregate level. But to your point, because of the data with permission and with uh, the right uh, uh, policies in place, we can actually use this data for personalization. And that's an important area that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. But I wanted to hand it back to you, see if you had any questions about that or comments, and then we can go on to the uh, rest of the material here. Well, very, very interesting and a, and a, a great example, Ashok, of um, how how data kind of that that's being generated for other purposes, you know, namely things like accounting and tracking the business, etc., can then be utilized to gain some uh, really, you know, hyper local micro insights into what's going on and and helping us understand the impact of disruptive events and, and other things. So, 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, um, if you'd like to be able to drill down into this data, uh, there is a website that's available. It's called tractorrecovery.org. And um, if you go there, you can actually start to drill down and look at the DMA level information, uh, look at state level information, and look at these trends. Um, the uh, information I'm just showing here is one view, super aggregated, but there's a lot of information there that's really interesting to go through. Thank, thank you, Ashok. Uh, let me uh, go back now and let's talk about AI, right? Um, it is receiving significant attention. It is a big challenge we mentioned. It's a very old concept, by the way. To me, it's over 100 years old, uh, honestly, and, and can go before the times of even Alan Turing. Uh, it got named in 1956 at a famous academic workshop. Uh, and despite much hype and fear, there were like a few, I would say, uh, successes and practical applications in the first 40 years, but not as big as was promised. So that excessive hike has led to a couple of what we call AI winters. The first winter where AI went from a very hot buzzword uh, uh, to a, we don't do that, we don't touch it, was mid 1970s. Uh, the second AI winter came in in the early 1990s and it seemed like as, as we went through, you know, recovered from the first winter, people didn't learn a lesson. You know, the, the temptation to overhype continued to be there. And when you overpromise and underdeliver, people react by saying, hey, this is, this is all useless. Um, the definition, by the way, of AI is very simple. Uh, it is the use of computers to simulate human intelligence, but there's big problems here. We don't know how to define intelligence. To this day, this is an open problem. So what is this intelligence? And then even simpler subparts of intelligence like common sense reasoning, which we all as humans seem to possess, very, very difficult to get going in, in, in a computer, despite the fact that computers today can beat the best chess champions, the best Go champions, uh, uh, they can beat humans at jeopardy, etc. cetera. Uh, machine learning, which enabled many of these uh, developments actually, is a subset of AI concerned with machines that modify a behavior uh, or learn as they see what we call training data, data that's been labeled saying, under these circumstances, predict the following output. But I'm gonna share with you some lessons learned during this uh, uh, class. Uh, most important lesson, number one is, reduce the problem domain where you're trying to apply this AI to something where complete knowledge is possible. And you might say, hey, complete knowledge, that sounds impossible, you can never have complete knowledge. Well, in fact, if you're, doing a chess, uh, a chess player, then if you have the board and the rules of the game and the positions of the pieces, uh, you're done. You have complete knowledge of the universe. And no, no surprise there, you can actually do much better than, than humans. This can happen also in factories when uh, settings are controlled, tasks are controlled. Uh, uh, you know, robots can be extremely effective and can do a lot of tasks uh, faster and probably more accurately than, than, than humans. Uh, but there is a, a problem here, uh, which is this doesn't necessarily help us understand kind of um, what is human intelligence, right? As an example, you know, if you wanted to understand what's in this basket, uh, you know, machine vision was, was lauded as one of the big problems, the big challenge problems in AI. Uh, so seeing a scene and figuring out what's in it. Well, here, humans can deal very well with things like occlusion or partial occlu occlusion, different lighting conditions, different orientations, all of that, very, very difficult for a computer to do it. Uh, so how did we solve it? Like the engineering solution to this was, okay, you know, slap a barcode on every item. And now you can actually recognize it even in the dark at different angles, dusty environments, do it much faster than humans. But again, it has no relation to how humans do machine vision, to, uh, <laughs> vision on and understanding scenes and, 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 and pictures. So, so that's an example of solutions that don't tell us much about human intelligence, but they work engineering wise. Now, unfortunately, the hype continues today. Uh, we still are hearing all sorts of uh, claims that AI is going to render us jobless, brainless. You know, everybody's scared of China 2030. In, 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 in the last winter, it used to be the Japanese fifth generation systems. Uh, and, and the hype is getting worse, right? And unfortunately, you know, Elon Musk is not doing us any favor. He, his latest predictions are you're going to have self, full self-driving Teslas in 2022. And again, uh, we can have a whole talk around why this is not going to happen, at least not in the approach we're taking.
to teaching machines how to drive. Uh, but you know that is going to probably lead us to another winter. And my personal prediction is within five years, we'll see the third AI winter. Uh, but the good news for the audience here today is machine learning as a subfield has survived both winters before brilliantly and is likely to survive the next winter. And, and the reason for this is, is not because we have better algorithms, not because we have developments on, on, on the AI technology, but we have a lot more data. So there's been a lot more data which enabled the, the ability to take that data as an opportunity to teach machines what to do under different inputs, what outputs are desired. Uh, I remind everyone, I mentioned that uh, most data is unstructured. Most organizations speak structured only and big data is, is also a difficult challenge. 85% of data projects fail according to uh, Gartner. Uh, lesson two, uh, Seems obvious, but it took many years to understand data is a necessary enabler for practical applied AI. So make sure data is captured and managed as an asset. And my question to many of you, think about the data in your company. Uh, is it an asset uh, or is it a liability? Is it really not being used to drive business? Is it sitting there waiting to be externally hacked or internally leaked? Is it just a cost center or is it something that actually is generating value? And that's the big difference here between the next generation companies that will be successful is being able to utilize data as an asset. Lesson three is these machine learning algorithms are, you know, in many cases, dumb, fragile, and, and brittle. They only know what you give them in the data. So you need to make sure that the data is there, easily accessible, very quickly, is of high quality because garbage in is garbage out. And most of the action is in how the data is represented so the algorithm can solve the problem. It's not the algorithm figuring out how to solve the problem. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind that it's very, very important to have the right data infrastructure and manipulation. Uh, we've worked in many applications and financial services I've, uh, around the globe. I've chosen here to show a few projects that are outside of financial. Uh, now maybe we have one insurance here represented, but in general, uh, you know, the, the same technology, the same thinking applies whether you're a telco, you're a manufacturer, you're a healthcare company, et cetera. Uh, and, and there are many, many applications of, of this technology. I'll do a few and then I'll hand it off to Ashok to share with you some experiences at Intuit and some case studies from there. Uh, one, one of my uh, favorite case studies was with Barclays Africa uh, Retail Bank. It's, it's one of the largest uh, out of South Africa. Um, we wanted to figure out when somebody is gonna go into overdraft and utilize that inference to send them an alert saying, hey, in two weeks, we predict in two weeks, you're gonna be in overdraft, click here to do something about it. Now, when you do an SMS campaign like this, if you get a 1% rate, that's typical 1% response rate. If you get 2%, that's amazing. The response rate here was 60%, right? And why? That's because of the timeliness of that message. We did it anticipating something and we did it in, in the right context very quickly. Uh, it got uh, a big NPS rating, which is how the bank uh, measures, meaning people actually favored the solution a lot. And it was kind of launched, went from pilot to launching at mass uh, very quickly. Uh, and that basically helps consumers avoid paying these overdraft fees and going into trouble. Uh, we then, uh, the teams then used the same technologies of real-time streaming and real-time uh, decisioning with AI to do things like influence customers to move to the digital channel. So. You know, and somebody goes to the branch, you know, in a typical bank uh, data cycle, it might be two weeks to eight weeks before you can send them a message saying, hey, we noticed you went to the branch and you could have avoided that. But when we changed this to real time, the response rate was much higher because we could send it the minute you entered the branch, we could actually send you an SMS saying, hey, you could have done this on mobile or you could have gone to the uh, internet. Uh, credit limit increases while you're shopping. So as you're shopping, we actually detect that event and we, we as if appropriate, we will send offers in this case, we'll increase your credit limit by 500 Rand or a thousand Rand, uh, click here to accept. And of course, uh, great uh, uh, response rate because of the timeliness of it. Uh, there's a lot of talk about chatbots and conversational AI. Uh, you know, these bots actually don't think of them as chatbots. They can help with things like onboarding customers, um, selecting say coverage and insurance, um, activation of customers, uh, claims processing, where we've worked on uh, several application where 
uh, insurance companies would achieve huge claims uh, processing savings by utilizing technology, uh, renewal setup, you know, reminder, advice, and prompts. To me, prompt is one of the biggest ways you can personalize. Can I send you the right prompt, the right reminder at the right time when it's relevant? Uh, and, and many, many benefits uh, derived from, from this kind of technology. So this leads us to lesson number four out of five, which is AI operations should model processes and aim to understand intent. So understanding who are the actors and what they want achieved is a big deal. By the way, some companies like Google have this done easily for them because when you go to Google search, you type in your intent in the search box. For most companies, we have to infer that information from these interactions and the interactions can be overwhelming and, and very difficult to, to infer. And that's why we kind of over the years built up an architecture for intent mapping these low level uh, interactions into uh, intent uh, inferences. With that, I'd like to turn it again to Ashok uh, to tell us about kind of doing AI at scale at a place like Intuit. Thanks, Osama. So I love the examples because you touched on personalization, you touched on recommendations, you touched on some financial services applications. I'm gonna talk about some of the, those areas specifically in, in uh, personal and small business finance. And on the next slide, again, you'll see that we're thinking about AI and data across a, a pretty large landscape. So it covers consumers, small businesses, and people who are self-employed. These uh, constituents, these cu customer groups, each have different specific needs. And you know the approach at a high level that we've taken is to really think about the end customer need and to build solutions for that need in a platform strategy. On the next slide, you'll see that the, that the key concept that we have in serving all of these customers is to build what we call an AI-driven expert platform. This is literally the strategy of the company. And if you'd like to learn more about it, you can read about it on our public website. Because the idea here is that we want to bring the power of AI that you've described along with expertise and that expertise could come from a human, it could come from a machine, build it as a platform so that we can solve problems for uh, end customers. And those end customers could be small businesses, they could be people who are self-employed, they could be consumers, but really helping them make the best financial decisions possible. Because the fact is that with COVID, with all of the unrest that's going on in the world, and generally speaking with the difficulty, how hard it is to run a small business, people really need to have the information at their disposal at the right time with the right uh, level of granularity so that they can make good decisions. This is all about powering those decisions. And as we say, powering prosperity around the world. So on the next slide, I've tried to summarize at the, the top points that we need to do in order to do an AI implementation at scale. And I can tell you that at Intuit, we're doing this at, uh, at a very, very large scale in terms of models, in terms of the uh, number of customer interactions that are powered by AI, uh, in terms of the amount of data that we're processing, it's quite extraordinary. And the way we went on this journey is that we said that we needed to create an organization that was AI ready, then figure out what the right applications are, and then accelerate those applications with AI uh, its speed and its scale. And speed and scale means a number of things. It means that we're uh, building fast and deploying fast, but it also means that we're scaling so that we can deal with hundreds of thousands, millions or tens of millions, or even larger hundreds of millions of customers all at once. So the first step on the next slide is to think about how to get the organization AI ready. And I think about this as a Venn diagram. Now, of course, we've got the AI and machine learning technologies that you, that you mentioned, but then we have data and we also need to have people. And the intersection of these three is really where the magic lies. You can have one or two of these things, but you don't get the accelerant, you don't get the benefit of AI unless you have all three of these things and they're working really well together. And so a lot of my time 
goes into making sure that these three areas are well represented and that they're working cohesively together. And so we're creating, we created a common mission for uh, AI and for data science across the company. We incorporated design thinking, and I'm gonna take you through a bit of that, that in a moment, because that plays an important role in the way we think about AI and its deployment. And then creating diverse and inclusive teams. And I'll talk a bit more about this one because it's super important in the way we uh, do our work. So on the next slide, thinking about design thinking. Frankly, at Intuit, it it's been around for about 40 years. And design thinking and customer obsession, I would say, is one of the foundational elements of, of this company's uh, 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 growth pattern. Now, the way we do this is we say, we're going to think about what un solved problems there are for customers. That's the first place that we start. What problems do real customers face? And we do follow me homes. So that means that we actually, uh, uh, in person or through Zoom, talk to customers and get data. Now you might say, well, this is sounds a little old fashioned. Like we've got all this data. Shouldn't we analyze that data and get insights at scale? We absolutely do that. But the personal touch that you get from talking to real people through focus groups, through Follow Me Homes is critically important. So we do all of those things together to figure out what the key unsolved problems are. And then um, I'm still on the incorporate design thinking slide. And then the next thing that we do is figure out what we can um, enable through the use of technology, through other elements, to help solve that problem, and then figure out whether this helps us build a durable advantage. Problem domains that fall into that area, into the intersection of these three, is where we believe success lies. That's what we call the customer-driven innovation element. Now, the next element that we work on is what we call design for delight. And this is a, the D4D process that we've implemented at scale at Intuit in AI, as well as in other parts of the company. We start with a deep customer empathy, and then we go broad to go narrow. So when we have that empathy, we understand what the customer problems are, and we list them out. There might be a very large number of, of uh, problems that we want to focus on. And then we start to narrow down and figure out which ones we want to solve and what experimentation we need to do to figure out if we're really solving it at scale or not. And so that's what the design for delight process is. And on the next slide, we start to think about how those learnings can be applied to data science. So I'm a data scientist myself. I know, Sama, you are also. A lot of us are. One of the things that I've found in working in this field for a long time is that you have to think like a product manager. And in fact, product managers need to think about it uh, from a data science perspective also. What this means is that we start to think about day-to-day -day collaborations and creating dialogue with product managers and think about what the product experience should be from the standpoint of AI. You mentioned that um, uh, we were at NASA together and frankly, even at NASA, which is not a consumer oriented place, which is not uh, one that uh, does finance or anything. I brought the same kind of mindset there. It was in that context, what do space scientists, what do astronomers, what do earth scientists need? What do scientists need? What do people in aeronautics need? And building that, I didn't know uh, of myself as a product manager back then, but thinking back, frankly, I was acting like a product manager in many ways for AI and for machine learning and disciplines. And I know you did the same thing, Osama, when you were at JPL. So the next uh, point I'd like to make is building a diverse and inclusive team. Now, I know this is very fashionable these days to talk about this in various contexts. I'm talking about this because it's super critical for us, for companies like us to have diversity and inclusivity in our teams because that customer empathy, that understanding of what the customer needs are comes through people, through our developers, through our AI and machine learning scientists and engineers, through our analysts. And they bring their own point of view. And when that gets mixed with the data, that level of diversity and inclusivity starts to show up in our products. And I think that builds great products. And so this has become an important part of our overall approach. And the next point is to um, figure out what the right 
uh, applications are for AI. And I've already taken you through the customer-driven innovation. And then the last point I'll make on the next slide is that we want to create AI efforts with speed and scale. And so this is where things really start to take off. On the left-hand side, you see uh, data sources going into a big data platform. We have an extraordinary platform that enables both real-time systems as well as batch uh, processing. We bring in external data sources and then put this through what we call the AI flywheel, where we do things like anomaly detection, diagnosis of what the issues might be, make predictions, take actions on that on an automated basis, and then drive that to customer endpoints. And then that all goes back to the AI and uh, machine learning and data platform through A-B testing. And this is being done at scale uh, across uh, uh, tens of millions of, of customers on an ongoing basis. It's very exciting to see this come to fruition. So a couple of examples. The first one, we're enabling customers to have more money, which is one of the key things that people want is more money so that they can run their small businesses and um, uh, understand how their, how their consumer uh, uh, situation is from a financial perspective. Here, we're building um, capabilities to forecast cash flow for small businesses. If you use QuickBooks, you can see it prominently displayed there. We're making forecasts at scale. And then we're also detecting fraud in real time. This is very exciting because essentially as merchants deal with customers, there could be fraud there. We're building machine learning technologies to look for fraud and make those fraud decisions in seconds and prevent it. And the scale is extraordinary that we're seeing in this context. So one of the exciting areas where we're bringing more money to customers. On the next area, enabling no work for customers. So people don't like to enter data. You were talking about accountants, you know, 100 years ago, even today, Frankly, people need to enter a lot of data into spreadsheets, do things manually. We want to eliminate all of that. This is a great example of computer vision, where essentially by taking a, a photo of a, a receipt that could be crumpled up or something, we can extract data out of it at seconds, in, within seconds. And we're doing this at scale through the use of AI and deep learning technologies. It's a super exciting area, a major investment for us. And then finally, yielding complete confidence. So one of the things that people want to do, want to know when they file their taxes is, did I do it correctly and am I done? You know, they want to have confidence in the process. And we have uh, over 50 million people who do taxes with us on a regular basis. At scale, this gives us a remarkable need to drive confidence. Now, I'm going to tell you a bit of a story about this. Whenever I'm doing a, a financial transaction and I have to enter the routing number and the bank account number, I remember like buying a house, uh, you know, you have to type these numbers and I'm always nervous about it. The reason I'm nervous is I'm really worried I'm going to type that number in incorrectly. Now, when you're doing this with your taxes, for a lot of people, their tax uh, refund is the largest paycheck they get in a year. They want to make sure that that refund makes it into their bank account, not someone else's bank account, or gets lost in cyberspace somewhere. Our team has built kind of a remarkable technology, in my opinion. As you're typing in the numbers, the AI system, based on deep learning, can figure out if those numbers are being typed in incorrectly. And no, we don't have a catalog of all the bank account numbers in the world, nor do we have all the routing numbers in the world. But what we do have is this really smart AI that can detect the pattern that's being typed in and determine if it's wrong. This single capability has saved our customers millions and millions of dollars and has delivered money to them faster. It's very exciting. Just one of the many, many examples of we have uh, the use of AI at scale at this company. So I'm going to stop there, Sama, and see if you've got any uh, insights, questions, and we can go on with the rest of this. Yeah, no, uh, amazing, amazing uh, examples, Ashok, of uh, A, how do you scale AI within an organization, and B, how you then apply it to very meaningful and kind of needle mover applications in, in the business. And uh, I still personally think there's a black magic in this last, you know, we can guess whether an account is valid or not, but, you know, hey, that's part of, you know, when, when you have enough data and you have a lot of AI, you know, a lot of these solutions look, look like magic, honestly. 
Uh, uh, which that's brings me to... Here. Uh, yeah, that's sorry, go ahead. Asama. I'm going to tell my team that Osama Fayad thinks it's black magic. That's going to just be so <laughs> golden for them. So thanks for that quote. <laughs> so, um, you know, in wrapping up, I shared with you four lessons learned. Uh, I just want to share the fifth and then move to a conclusion and, and, and take any questions. Uh, the fifth lesson is that there is no autonomous AI and there is no general AI. It's, it's about human-centered AI systems that help humans perform much of the low level work quickly and accurately amplifying their abilities. And if you set that goal in your mind and give up on this idea that something can be completely or totally autonomous, you're probably on, on the safe uh, range here and you're probably building uh, towards a robust solution. Now, we said uh, AI depends on data. And when you ask most companies we work with, what do you want from the data? Well, we want it to be reliable, affordable, timely, accurate, comprehensive, unified, accessible, easy to understand, easy to embed, the wish list, right? Reality is uh, none of these hold true. It's unreliable, it's very expensive, it's batch and slow in typical scenarios. And you know, kudos to Intuit, they, they actually invested in building the data platform that enabled them to do all this uh, advanced data, data science. And they leveraged things like, like big data uh, uh, to, to, to address this. A quick example I'll share with you is something we did at Barclays where we built a big data uh, database that brings together a, a data lake or a lake house um, to bring together data from across various activities. And you have to use big data here because the data is often unstructured and not linked together and all of that good stuff for cybersecurity. But what happened became very interesting. Suddenly when people realized we have this data well, financial crime wanted it to do things like detect, you know, AML and, and KYC. Fraud wanted it, as uh, uh, was mentioned before by Ashok, to do better fraud detection, credit card, debit card, and, and other fraud types. Marketing teams wanted it, the risk team and finance team wanted it. So the point is, is if you build the right infrastructure and the right data as a service, a lot of uh, different organizations will come to it. There is an art to building this. We, uh, you have to have a data strategy that is you know anchored in revenue uh, our five r's are revenue relevance reference regulation and roadmap uh, we we can talk to you about some of these and what they mean and how to think about data strategy and we've done this so many times that now we you know the team ends up doing a data strategy in in a few weeks you know two three weeks you have a data strategy that is very robust and grounded and that tells you what is the roadmap for building the data solutions and uh, ultimately the AI solutions? Having done this, we've learned from a lot of lessons. Uh, you know, these solutions don't, should not be breaking the budget. Uh, you have to leverage a lot of the available techniques to kind of do it cheap, do it with open source, leverage automation, garbage in, garbage out. So you must have the built in data governance and processing. Uh, don't get trapped in the structured data only. Think from the beginning about that majority of the data that's unstructured. And then don't go after these long-term, uh, <clears throat> you know, boil the ocean solutions for data. Uh, build a strategic kind of blueprint architecture, which we have done, and then build out your data as a service incrementally in thin slices, each time with a use case that has, uh, makes a difference to the business. And as long as you tie it, to delivering value to the business, usually our magic number is 12 weeks. Every 12 weeks, there's no value delivered. That keeps everybody engaged, that generates more demand and people really get to understand the value of this. And of course, and uh, Ashok alluded to this in a very big way, the lack of talent, uh, let, let alone diverse talent is a big problem. Uh, and, and that's why we've evolved kind of ways to attract the right data specialist and, and data academy to help our customers uh, get this capability going. Uh, you know, typically your data, for example, about customers is sitting everywhere in multiple systems. How do you bring it all together in what we call a customer 360 or a, a unified customer view? And then how do you leverage this to basically make it convenient to understand what you know about customers, how to use it, when to use it, how to embed it in different applications, uh, et cetera. So with that, I will move to my conclusions here, the big questions for you to ask as you think about this area for AI and making it work. Uh, you know, is data under control? And by the way, I warn you, big data can easily generate a, a, a big mess. So you have to be very careful how you build it. And that's why many projects there fail. 
Um, and then, uh, you know, do you make analytics easy? Uh, how do we do this in an affordable model, not in something that breaks the bank? Uh, how do you drive AI with data? And how do we do this quickly? And to me, quickly is a key. And the solution in my mind is you have to build towards the data as a service, built-in governance, built-in standards, and build, you build that data as a service in these thin slices, uh, slice at a time, each addressing uh, a use case. So with that, I'll uh, conclude here. And if there are any questions, we'll take them now. If, you, if we don't have time for questions, we'll be more than happy to take your questions and answer them online. So by all means, reach out uh, via um, social media, uh, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, where have you, and we will put the questions together. We will answer them through blogs. We've also highlighted some of the blogs from uh, Intuit here that are very interesting. These are links that we will also publish uh, where you can find all of these things uh, online. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Ashok, for uh, helping us kind of understand how uh, a place like Intuit put data to use. Uh, and uh, I will stop the sharing in a minute and, and turn to questions. Any final comments, Ashok? Osama, this was so fun. Thank you for inviting me. And I think that the journey that you described is exactly right, that creating a data service uh, platform and then building AI on top of it, uh, that actually works. We've done that um, in, in multiple contexts and seen that it actually produces a great deal of results. OK, so with that, uh... I think we pretty much actually hit our time limit. Uh, so we'll probably have to go to a Q&A that we do online, uh, unless there is any last minute Q&A questions that uh, we want to address right now. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for attending and encourage you uh, to get in touch. And uh, hopefully you have found this masterclass useful uh, in a pragmatic way and how to think about AI uh, for your business, what it takes to make it work and the importance of data in this whole journey. So thanks everyone. Um, and uh, we will wrap up now and we'll take your questions online. Thanks.